What's up humans and non-humans? Look, I don't want to spend too much time in the intro here, but I wanted to say this at least one more time. I like this show. I do. I very much appreciate the effort and attention to detail that clearly went into the story and the look and feel of basically everything we see on screen. Except for the casting. <clears throat> and as dumb as some of the shit they say is, at least some of the showrunners have proven that they actually know what they're doing. That said, episodes 6 and 7 are my least favorite by far. Let's get to work. So three months have passed since the events of episode five. We open on a snowy landscape and a remote log cabin where Joel and Ellie are waiting in ambush for, and I had to look this up, Marlin, played by Kicking Bird from Dances with Wolves, Buff. to return from his rabbit hunting trip out in the great rabbit wilds of Colorado, I think. And I immediately have a problem with this scene. Yeah? Look, I like Marlin and Florence. They were very convincing as an old couple, and I like the way that they played off Joel and Ellie. But I mean, dude, if you're living off of rabbits and squirrels and shit, it just seems kind of unlikely that you'd have enough of it to... I mean, is Dancing Bear just that good of a hunter? Could there really be so much game in this location that these two could not only survive, but actually have way more than they need? Is there a fucking chocolate tree in the backyard? Please stop forcing me to ask these questions. It doesn't harm the plot, GK. Yeah, but it harms the world building. Fine, whatever. Kicking Bird and Dances with Donuts are super lucky with food. They're completely unimpressed at being held hostage at gunpoint until they, what, help with directions? Like, why do they have to hold him hostage in the first place? They tell Joel that the place that they're looking for is like super dangerous. And it's all ominous and shit. And then they leave. Ellie jacks them for a rabbit, which is fine, because Dancing Bear can just, you know, just head back out to the rabbit store, no big deal. And Joel has his first panic attack. Yeah! This happens, I think, one more time during this episode, and then it never happens again. It just disappears like a fart in the wind. It didn't happen before this either. It didn't happen in the game, and nothing comes as a consequence of it. So it just feels tacked on. Like another example of the writers feeling the understandable boredom of the fact that their jobs are basically just to copy-paste events from the game into a live-action format. Look, it's believable that Joel might have PTSD. It's believable, okay? It's not unrealistic. It's fine. But I think the way they used it here was lazy. So they make it as far as the river and make camp. And here we have the scene that I referenced in the last video. I know, stupid. Where Ellie admits to putting Joel, Henry, and herself in danger while simultaneously denying Henry the right to decide for himself how to deal with that particular fucked up ass situation. <laughs> so Joel takes both watch shifts. And then of course, Joel falls asleep because he's been staying awake all this time like a dumbass. And of course, Ellie bails him out and she's all smug about it the next morning. I'm responsible for you, okay? Then don't fall asleep. The show is telling us that Joel, out of some misguided sense of paternity or more likely masculinity, is taking on way more than he can handle. Great, only one problem. This makes him kind of stupid. Surely he understands that he can't just stay awake forever. Besides, I thought we already moved past all this, I'll handle all the stuff because you're just a kid crap. You know, when she saved his life by shooting a guy in the fucking spine, and then he gave her gun back. Why wouldn't he just take second watch or something? And this at the end of a day where he's had a panic attack as well. Maybe you need some sleep, bro. What the fuck, dude? Why'd you fire your gun? I'm sure someone's gonna tell me, and I'm gonna be like, Oh, right, 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 right. But at the time of writing this, I still cannot think of one good reason to fire your gun into the air. Are you testing to see if there are zombies out there? Or humans? The river of death. Still no people. If so, you just alerted them to your presence. Now they're gonna be charging you. You just lost the element of surprise. And you wasted a round. Good job, dum-dum. Can I just say though, I fucking love the fact that they actually went on location in real cold places for this. I feel like everything nowadays is shot in front of a fucking green screen or volume or something like that. It's nice to see people doing the real thing for a change. It just lends so much weight to the realism of every single thing that they show on screen. It's great stuff. And then Joel can't read a map. I mean, would it have killed them to let Joel figure this out? That's two major fuck-ups for Joel now. These are deliberate, fellas. Gotta point it out. 
So a dog that can sense the infection doesn't sense the infection in Ellie, even though the infection can be detected in her as shown in episode one. But as Rags from EFAP pointed out, and he's a dog himself, so he would know, dogs might sense this type of thing a little differently. Like for instance, they might smell the infection on a wound or in some other way that it manifests physically in the body of an infected person. You know, like maybe when you're infected, just once a day you poop a little bit. Not enough for humans to detect, but just enough for a dog. And the little gizmo that detects the infection in humans is actually testing your blood. It's actually sticking a little needle in your in your neck and it tests your blood. Like the dog's not smelling it in your veins, it's smelling it some other way. It's, it's sensing it in some other way. Still, I guess the real criticism here would be the cheap trick that doesn't seem to consider like 90% of the audience will have played the game and knows Ellie doesn't fucking die here. <laughs> But go ahead, I'll just take this opportunity to, um... Damn, there isn't really any time for anything, is there? You know, now would have been a pretty good time for Joel to have another panic attack. Just saying. Anyway, so the dog fakes us all out, we were all fooled, and, uh, and he starts playing with Ellie and it's all good. And then they're like, okay, I guess you guys are cool. And then, and then Maria's like, wait a minute. What's your name? And he's like, my name's Joel! I mean... <clears throat> My name's Joel. And then like, you know, and then and then they go inside and as they're going through the town, Joel sees his brother and they have their reunion and it's it's honestly really cool. This part got me kind of in the feels. <laughs> Ellie eats again. It's not as bad this time. What? What's wrong with you? I'm with Joel on this one. What the fuck, dude? Since when is Ellie a dick to people for no reason? So the girl's staring. So... They're strangers in a wasteland. This is a closed community out in the middle of nowhere. It's not weird at all for someone to be curious. Is that going to end up being Ellie's girlfriend in part two? I don't know. I just have this feeling. Kids around here don't usually look or talk like you. Wow. Okay. Judgy. Kids don't usually look or talk like her? What the fuck does that mean? And when did we see Ellie talking to anyone? Up until just now. And what does she look like? I mean, Ellie does have kind of a weird face, but it's not nice to point stuff like that out. Or so everyone keeps telling me. They also aren't armed. They also aren't armed. <laughs> Her voice is so annoying sometimes, I swear. Hey, you're breaking balls. Hey, you're breaking balls. A bad reputation doesn't mean you're bad. Not always, at least. Okay, so Joel has a reputation. No doubt Tommy has told Maria all about his past, including the part that Joel played in it. But why is she giving Joel the stink eye? She seems to be harboring a much deeper distrust of him than would be warranted by anything she might have heard about his past. Almost as if she's personally witnessed something that left its mark on her. But we know she didn't witness anything. What's her name? She's never met him until now. All she knows of Joel is what she's heard from Tommy. Is the show trying to say Tommy talked all kinds of shit about Joel? Like enough to make Maria outwardly show her disapproval of him to his face? Enough to make her go out of her way to warn Ellie against him, despite the fact that they're fucking family now? You call this up there and that down there family? I fucking hope not, dude, because that would be pretty damaging to Tommy's character, but it never gets explained. She references her knowledge of the past, but again, that only tells us that she's aware of it, not why she's being a butthole about it. Clearly, she doesn't approve of the deeds that they did back in those days. But for one thing, it's in the fucking past. And for another thing, as Ellie points out, Tommy did those fucking things too. And yeah, he was following Joel. But Joel was protecting Tommy. So checkmate. What now? What else do you have? Uh, I just have an irrational hatred for this guy for no fucking reason, even though he's my brother-in-law. And we're, like, I mean, come on. Headshot those fuckers from a half mile out. Can you teach me how? No, we can't. Why not? I thought we were done with this. Why wouldn't you want Ellie to know how to handle herself? Look, the more shit she knows how to do, the better chances of success your journey has. Okay? Plain and simple. And Joel would know that, right? I mean, otherwise, how has he survived for this long? There's a reference to communism, communism that a lot of people were well, communists. sensitive to, which is understandable if you consider the placement of the line. It comes right after Ellie says, This place actually fucking works. This is the commune. 
We're communists. But there is actually clarification to the fact that communism isn't a useful system on a larger scale. Is that how things used to be? No, the country is too big for that. At least I, I hope. Because otherwise the show just advocated for communism, which is pretty ass. And not in a good way. Some people wanted to own everything. And some people didn't want anyone to own anything at all. What about the third kind, Joel? You know, everyone else. People who don't want to own everything, but do want to own their possessions. What about them, Joel? Just this little look that Joel gives. This little moment where he smiles at the thought of having whiskey, bacon, bacon and Christmas trees. This place has got to be the closest thing he's seen to the world that he remembers in over 20 years. Doesn't seem like you age much. I was interested to see where they would take this scene because honestly, the, its counterpart in the game is kind of lacking. In, in the game, Joel just kind of comes right out and tells Tommy that she's immune and that he wants to ditch her and have Tommy take her the rest of the way. It sort of seems to come out of nowhere because we, playing as Joel, have been through a lot with Ellie. And then suddenly, the second Joel gets a moment away from her, he's like, all right, I'm out. It's just weird. So I liked what they did with it in the show a little bit better, even though Joel does lie to Tommy like twice in 15 seconds. So how's Tess? She's fine. And the kid? Oh, yeah. She's fine. So Tommy's gonna be a dad. And Joel doesn't really react all that well to this news. He kind of gets quiet, and when Tommy says, I feel like I'd be a good dad, Joel downs his drink, and he just kind of says, Guess we'll find out. And Tommy gets all pissed off, but, I mean, he was there when Joel lost his daughter. Please, I know, baby, I know. He knows the pain he went through. Sarah. And the man that he became as a result. In the game, Joel has almost no reaction at all to Tommy starting up a family. Thanks for not blowing my head off. Would have been embarrassing, considering you're my brother-in-law. So this is actually kind of better. But here's how I think it should have gone. Joel gives a weak smile and empties his glass. Tommy notices his brother's reaction with a thoughtful expression, and he tries to comfort him. Joel, being habitually self-reliant, pulls away from Tommy, and there's an uncomfortable silence before he tells Tommy the truth about Ellie. This takes Tommy aback. He asks Tommy to take Ellie the rest of the way to the Fireflies. This part could come straight from the game. Have Maria get some of your born again friends to do it. They got families too. Tommy gets mad at Joel for asking this of him after he just learned that Tommy's about to be a father. But Joel, desperate to free himself from what he sees as a potential repeat of losing Sarah, presses and forces Tommy to put his foot down. Then Joel gets in his face about being ungrateful after everything he did to keep them both alive. That's what you call it? Tommy pushes back that he has nothing but nightmares from those days. He says, just because life stopped for you, doesn't mean it has to stop for me. And then Joel storms out much like the way he does in the show and then has another panic attack. There, all better. This not only blends what happens in the show better with what happens in the game, but it also clears up any confusion about the motivations for their anger and, and where the argument kind of comes from. Yeah, this was weird. Ellie gets like a pre-used period apparatus thing. Gross. Correct. This is gross. This is not wrapped. And as is confirmed in the dialogue from Maria, they share everything and have a bartering system. Therefore, I think it's safe to assume it's been used before now. I was very surprised to see no one commenting on this. Maybe because it doesn't impact the plot, but it is there. The showrunners intentionally included it. It takes up screen time. They reference it again like a minute later. And if it doesn't impact the plot, then why did they go out of their way to draw attention to it? I mean, there is kind of an argument for it having something to do with world building, I guess. But did we need it? Why are we even doing this? Oh, I just wanted everybody to know the periods are a thing. Yeah, thanks, dude. We know. You gonna show me Joel taking a shit next? So, included along with the pre-used vag dam, there's a note with instructions for Ellie to meet Maria across the street at her house. Hello? When she gets there, the house is empty. Maria has gone out to find Ellie a jacket. And Ellie finds a small memorial for two children. And this is a good little bit of, of filmmaking here. It tells us that Tommy still holds Sarah in his thoughts, that Maria lost a child as well, and that she definitely knows not just about Joel's loss, but understands his pain as well. All of this is accomplished in one short moment with zero dialogue. 
This is not just the writers doing their jobs. This is the writers doing their jobs well. But then seconds later, Maria demonstrates a complete lack of empathy for Joel when she attempts to warn Ellie against him. But there are clearly things you don't know about Joel. Even though she knows all the details about what happened back in those days, she understands the circumstances of the apocalypse. She went through it herself. She lost a kid herself. She knows the pain he must have been feeling. She understands that he's a man and he was trying to take care of his brother. She's completely adversarial towards him like every single time they share the screen. It makes her a cunt. And if that's what you were going for, good job. You fucking succeeded. But I don't think that's what you're going for. So then Ellie goes and watches a movie. Joel's in the uh, boots store trying to fix his well, boots. Hey, look, they referenced the handy broke on dude's head in episode one. Huh, that's neat. Anyway, Joel cries because of course he does. And Tommy finally agrees to take Ellie off of his hands. Stop crying. Ellie's chilling out in the house that they gave her, which used to belong to someone else, I guess. Reading someone's diary. Not cool, dude. And she fights with Joel. You're not my daughter. And I sure as hell ain't your dad. Joel leaves and then goes to bed. But just before turning off the light, he's like, maybe she is my daughter, kinda. Then in the next scene, Tommy's like, let's go to the fireflies. And she's already dressed and packed because she's so smart. But then Joel's already there and he's like, I'm here because I changed my mind. Joel has to borrow his brother's rifle because- Cause Maria took mine, you know. I already said yes, Joel. Uh, Maria wouldn't give their guns back? What the fuck? I, I really don't like her in this. She's such a fucking- <laughs> There's a nice scene where Joel is teaching Ellie how to shoot the rifle. I like this scene. And it makes you think they might be trying to set something up with it, like maybe this? You reckon you can handle that? But no, Ellie turns out to kind of suck with the rifle. It's not surprising, things bigger than she is. Just a nice moment between Joel and Ellie goes to character development. Five days later, they arrive at the campus where the fireflies are supposed to be. And this is basically right out of the game as well. You got the monkeys, you got the horse, the lab being empty, even the monkey jump scare thing that happens, the fight with the humans, Joel getting wounded. The, the way they do this in the game is much more intense and engaging, but the one in the show makes a lot more sense and is more believable. This is also the scene where Joel and Ellie discover a map that the fireflies just kind of left out in the open. And it has like clear indicators to the fact that they moved to a place called St. Mary's in Salt Lake City. And I just have to ask, do the Fireflies want to be discovered? I thought they were trying to keep their presence on the DL. You know, so that Fedra won't find and delete them off the face of the planet. But they leave enough evidence behind that one of these monkeys would be able to find them. No offense, monkeys. Anyway, at this point, they hear voices outside. Somebody's coughing. You can hear a little bit of talking. And Joel's like, bro, there's people. Let's go out the back. They sneak to their horse and are attacked by a dude with a baseball bat. It's a good thing these guys aren't carrying anything more deadly than a fucking broom handle, because if they were carrying guns, Joel and Ellie would be cannibal stew by sundown. But Ellie manages to warn Joel in time so that he can duck, and the guy just breaks his bat against the tree that their horse was tied to. Joel's like, <laughs> and snaps the dude's neck. And he's like, yeah, I got him. And Ellie's like, dude. And he's like, what? Then Joel looks down and notices the handle of the baseball bat sticking out of his lower intestine. And he's like, Hot oh, dang. Then the cannibals come out and they're like, hey. Joel and Ellie get on their horse and then ride off. Again, very lucky these people didn't bring guns with them on their scouting mission into the zombie infested wilderness. Cause Joel's badly hurt. Their horse is carrying two and they're within throwing distance of these fucking people. Ellie does shoot at them though, that helps. Even if they did have guns, they would have to take cover and you know, that helps. Anyway, they escape, but Joel's not doing so hot and he falls off the horse. And then Ellie's like, Joel, quit being a little bitch. And Joel's like, fuck you, I'm dying. And then the episode ends. Not my favorite episode, but it's better than, hmm, no. This is literally the second worst episode of the whole season. I didn't like Maria or literally any of the added shit she says or does. Joel is given an ailment and then cured of it in the same episode. The showrunners really do seem to like writing things into the story that have no lasting impact, don't they? Other than that, it was a nice break from the big blowout that we had in the previous episode. Shit was getting pretty intense. It's a chance for Joel and Ellie to catch their breath and get cleaned up. And now that we've had that, we can get back to the journey, right? Right? Fuck. Thanks for watching, guys. Please like, share, and subscribe. If you want to see more of this kind of stuff, 
let me know down in the comments, or you can join the Discord. It's a small little group of nerds over there, but we'd love to have you. You can find links to all of my socials in the description. Follow me on Twitter if you're interested in that, and if you really like my content, there are videos by the way. Consider supporting me on Patreon, and help me realize my dream of making cool shit for a living. Alright, that's it for me. I'm out. Peace out, guys.